This talk is being presented on the land of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation here in Victoria, Australia, and I'd like to acknowledge and pay my respects to their elders, past, present, and emerging, and acknowledge that sovereignty was never ceded, no treaty was signed, and this so-called Australia always has been and always will be Aboriginal land. Hello and welcome. My name is Mina Shamali, and I'm the composer for the game Enchanted that is being developed by Dragon Bear Studios here in Victoria, Australia. And this is a game with a strong indigenous focus and design and representation. So I'd like to speak on the honor and privilege I have of having been asked to do this, to write music for this project. The audacity of uh, even approaching it being a non-Indigenous Australian composer. And the process of collaborating with some of Australia's finest First Nations musicians to help bring the soundtrack to life and shine the most beautiful light possible on this game and its music. Paulina Sammy, the creative director for Dragon Bear Studios, approaches me about potentially writing music for the game they're working on. As she goes on to describe Enchanted, this co-op adventure where you're running an inn, you're serving customers, you're pacifying and fighting monsters, you're dealing with otherworldly creatures. Uh, you're running this inn while trying to defeat an evil wizard who happens to be your landlord. <laughs> And uh, the world of this game is a fantasy version of medieval Australia, uh, where the sovereign leaders of the land are its indigenous elders. And the society that it exists in is globalized and multicultural, but with a very strong roots in indigenous culture. Uh, the game is, uh, was being developed with a lot of collaboration with indigenous elders and communities. That's such a diverse team from all different kinds of backgrounds, uh, including indigenous artists and indigenous game designers. And the first question I had was, why me? I'm not an indigenous Australian composer. I maybe shouldn't be doing this. And there seems to be little to no presence of indigenous Australian game composers. However, the developers were very keen to have indigenous musicians be the beating heart of the soundtrack. And uh, they were trusting my cultural purview and my point of view of how I would approach working with the music of other cultures, just from the music they'd heard from me before and from our conversations uh, together. So I said, you know, in agreement with their cultural consultants, with indigenous members of their team, I said, go ahead, we're trusting you with this. Trust you, you're not screwed up. So off I went on the adventure of creating the score to enchant it. Now, who am I? I am a person of Middle Eastern descent. I am part Lebanese, part Egyptian by heritage. And I used to live in the United Arab Emirates before migrating to Australia with my family at the age of 15. I spent over half my life uh, in this country and at this point I'm an Australian citizen, whatever that means, I don't really feel like I'm from anywhere, but I'm from everywhere all at once. It's a very uh, strange place to be in sometimes, but uh, offers some uh, unique elements to my point of view. I also grew up with video games and at the age of 16, I thoroughly fell in love with video game music as a result of playing Hitman 2 Silent Assassin back in 2002. Uh, the music by Danish composer Jesper Kidd blew me away. It was strange and it was awesome. By the age of 20, I had decided I'm going to be a video game composer. I also started to develop my skills as an instrumentalist and vocalist, uh, as a session musician uh, to be working with other composers. Uh, I'd play the piano, the guitar, the oud, which is the Middle Eastern lute, and I'd sing vocals in a Middle Eastern style. Middle Eastern vocal styles and languages were something I grew up with and I knew intimately well. So I was able to collaborate with a few composers I really admire and 
basically they'd come up to me and say, Hey, here's the general framework of what we're trying to do with this piece or this soundtrack. Um, could you improvise something based on your own knowledge and connection, uh, to Middle Eastern culture or language, uh, that you know intimately well in ways that we possibly couldn't. So that became a lot of my experience as a session musician is basically connecting with the music of my heritage and creating something new out of that to fit someone's project. Uh, and it's really cool to be approached in this way and say, hey, uh, we want to respect your cultural representation in this project. So could we include you in this conversation and this process and even ask you to be part of the music? Now, alongside that, my love of video game music and film music led me down some interesting paths and uh, in 2018, I was invited to present a show on the radio on ABC Classic, a station I'd listened to since I was 15 years old, specifically concerned with video game music. I was able to delve even more deeply into my love of video game music, and it, video games became a core of my work, both talking about them and now trying to make them. And... I particularly love the way culture can be celebrated and accessed through video games and video game music. Uh, one of the earliest examples for me was the score to the first Assassin's Creed, again by a Danish composer, a Scandinavian human as white as possible, who approached this world set in the Middle East in, during the Third Crusade. And just hearing a score that was such a blend of creativity and incredible Middle Eastern musicianship, you could really hear that Middle Eastern instrumentalists were really doing what they did best. They really called on for their knowledge and connection to culture. And then the composer would bring their work into his creative process and the resulting thing, the resulting score would be otherworldly. <laughs> And it's still one of my absolute favorite scores. And that's one of those things I love exploring in video game music and film music. Now, based on my work as a composer, my knowledge of video game music, and my experience as a session musician who is specifically called upon for cultural connection, I was able to begin thinking about how I'd approach writing the music to Enchanted. Now, one of the great examples in recent years of this process is the score to Black Panther by Ludwig Göransson. Ludwig Göransson is a Swedish composer, yet he wrote this score to an unapologetically African superhero. I've been working with the director Ryan Coogler for about 10 years now, and when I read the script he wrote for Black Panther, I was immediately blown away, and I'm, I'm like, the only way I can write music that fits these colors and images and stories I'm reading is to go to Africa and to do research. One of the first things that I did was to figure out where to go. You know, it's a big continent and there's so much different music in every country, in every different tribe. They all have their different instruments. They all have their different language. I called a lot of friends that's, that's been traveling around there and one of my friends produced um, an album with an African artist. His name is Baba Mal. I called him and I was like, hey, my name is Ludwig Goransson and I'm a film composer and I'm about to score a movie uh, called Black Panther. It's about a black superhero in a fictional country in Africa. Would you have any time for me to come out and meet you or record you or anything? And he was like, yeah, sure. Just I'm about to go on tour. You can you can, you can come join my tour. And after following me around for tour for a week, I was able to borrow his studio and record his favorite musicians. That was the start of the Black Panther score right there. I think the thing about Ludwig Göransson 
in this score is that he never takes over the voice of the filmmaker or never tries to obscure the voices of the musicians. What he creates is a space for them to beautifully shine and uh, really set some light on the cultural influences and uh, unique perspectives presented in Black Panther. In the world of video games, the recent soundtrack to Ghost of Tsushima uh, was largely composed by a British composer, Ilan Eshkeri. Now, this is a game that depicts Japan during the 13th century, and it was created with a lot of cultural consultation. The British composer, Ilan Eshkeri, went into this deep dive of studying Japanese music. He studied ancient Japanese music, uh, folk tunes, sacred melodies, uh, drum rhythms, and uh, all the different scales that form part of Japanese music theory. And in making the score come to life, he collaborated with Japanese musicians and really brought their voices to the fore and never tried to speak for Japanese culture. He let Japanese culture speak through his music. He let those instrumentalists and their voices shine as he created the framework around them and then accompanied them. It was like a jam session almost. It's almost like a performance together, but displaced in time as all these sessions <laughs> happen around the world. The spirit of collaboration that is respectful of each other's voices and cultures, never stepping on anyone's toes. When you see musicians in the jam session, it's all about creating space for each other. And that's one of the incredible things I find in the world of video game music. So as I got into this process of writing the music for Enchanted, I went into my own deep dive. I listened to as many uh, different First Nations musicians as possible in all different kinds of genres, people using different instruments, using indigenous instruments and non-indigenous instruments. And I fell in love with the way indigenous musicians are rooted firmly in culture and yet their art is never static. It is forever pushing boundaries and mixing influences, but it is so firmly grounded in their heritage. Some incredible hip hop artists like Baker Boy. Some R&B musicians like Mojo Juju. It's where I live. It's where I want to be. So ill at ease. Uh, some great groups like Dreaming Now, led by Neil Morris. We've been here since the beginning, descended from sacred obligations. We still stand by those. And some mind blowing practitioners in the classical realm, like Deborah Cheatham. William Barton, who is one of Australia's most well-known didgeridoo players, or yidaki players, that's the name of the instrument, in Arnhem Land in the Northern Territory where it was born. Um, William Barton does a lot of incredible collaboration with the yidaki. Uh, he does some solo stuff where he plays guitar and sings. <laughs> He collaborates uh, with ensembles like the Sydney Symphony Orchestra. He collaborates with Mongolian and Tibetan musicians. Whoa. 
and even with classical Indian and jazz musicians together. And it's incredible to just hear how his practice is firmly rooted in his culture and yet again never static that's where i felt uh this chord be going it wasn't about trying to recreate the sound of indigenous culture but rather let first nations musicians express themselves and shine a light on them and collaborate with them it's it's a conversation it's collaboration it's evolution it's rooted in culture but never static. So the steps of this process will begin with having a conversation where I kind of get to know who they are, get to know their musical practice, their, uh, their own connection to their heritage, and then uh, invite them into the studio and record them basically just cutting loose. We'll play the game a little bit, talk about it, talk about the story, talk about uh, what it looks like and what it feels like. And then basically just let them respond to that as a stimulus. What is their innate uh, response to the game? I'm never telling them what sounds to make or what notes to play. It's more a question of what does your gut tell you as uh, someone with your own musical practice and your own connection to the indigenous culture being depicted in this game. And then based on that session, I'd have access to these recordings as a library for reference and for incorporation. I could cut up bits of these recordings and manipulate them in certain ways or use them, use parts of them as they are and create something around them or completely process them beyond recognition in order to create completely new sounds. And throughout this process, I'm still talking to the musicians, consulting with them, saying, what do you think when I take your instrument and I do this with it? Because I want to make sure that they feel uh, respected in the process. They feel their work is being honored in this process. And then after I've uh, had a lot more work developing the soundtrack and kind of uh, creating a more solid framework of what it would sound like, I would bring that soundtrack back to them in a second session or a final session uh, where I'd have written parts for the musicians based on what I know they've enjoyed playing in that first session. It's like, oh, they like to play fast stuff that kind of sounds like this. Okay, if I write something in this style uh, and present it to them, how would they interpret that? How would they respond to that? So hopefully uh, they feel like this is them. This really embodies their spirit. And then they could also take these, take these lines that I've written and have their own creative freedom with them and and even create completely new performances that can then inspire other parts of the soundtrack. And this process is forever cyclical and beautiful and just uh, such a positive feedback loop in and of itself. So now I had to find the musicians. I put out a call on my social media and I said, hey, uh, working on this soundtrack, uh, who are some of the most awesome indigenous musicians uh, we know that would like to get involved. And more than one person suggested Alara. And I checked out her work and I came across this incredible musician uh, who plays double bass, electric bass. She does stuff with looping pedals and, you know, recording herself and playing on top of herself. Uh, she was a poet, she was a singer, and just an all-round incredible artist. <laughs> Free from cop that muddy bastard. He was never invited. The river flows in Kookaburra sings. I sent her a message and I said, hey. Um, do you potentially want to do this? So she said, yeah, sure. Let's give it a try. And I had a bit of a conversation, uh, getting to know who she is. I'm Yoro Yoro Winya. I, um, 
I'm living here on Wurundjeri country, but grew up in Jajarang, um country in Bendigo. I write music and play bass. I love looping the double bass and I love finding the sounds um, that the double bass can make, both plucked um, and with the bow. And I love using different effects on the bass, like delay and reverb and, um, and the textures and layering it up. Um, so I have a lot of fun with that and I also love adding in other textures like keys sounds and um, and then like different sounds with my breath as well um, in some of my work. Um, I've got my, my clap sticks that I use and my grandfather made um, and gifted to me these. That's so amazing. yeah. That's beautiful. So I like to make, um, I like to create really sort of groovy but also kind of just um, floating soundtracks that I guess replicate um, the environment and I guess extend out the the conversations that I want to have through my poetry as well. I mainly just say master of none, jack of all. Um, so <laughs> it's incredible what we're capable of learning if we're given the opportunity, anybody. Um, but it's about how we do it um, and with the spirit that we do it and with the intention that we do it that I think makes the difference. Um, we've always sung and, and danced and um, created art on these this land so-called Australia. And so for me, it's the conversation is a continuation of that, um, which is, is political um, from the sheer fact that we've survived to be able to continue doing that in um, in the modern day. I guess the conversations um, in the music and the spirit is, is survival and its strength, its resilience, its culture, its hope, um, and it's for country and it's to heal country, which also at the same time in parallel helps to heal us. It's really important, I think, that we can identify and and celebrate that identity and celebrate that within our music as well and um, and be be really careful of um, honoring our cultural integrity in in every way that we create and perform and to do that you obviously have to be aware of it so there's like that first step of understanding your own identity and then and then your privileges within that space so um, like I, I've got a privilege as um, someone with fair is someone with fair skin, and the same way you've got a privilege as as being like a, a settler or um, somebody who isn't of First Nations to this land, and so it's just like about understanding all of the aspects of it, and um, and yeah, just being responsible with whatever that is. I invited over to the studio, and we played the game a little bit, talked about it, and uh, just put it on on the screen in the background, and let her kind of just. Cut loose, see what she would do. She created an incredible uh, amount of material that I could then use as a reference and uh, manipulate and process in uh, hopefully very creative ways that still felt like they were honoring what she did and honoring her performances. 
Then something interesting happened. Later in the year, on another project, I was going to go on tour with the spoken word artist, Luca Lesson, and uh, we collaborated together for years. So I looked at two of the performances, and there was Alara as one of the supporting acts. <laughs> so we got this incredible chance to reconnect in a very different context outside of working on a video game where we got to perform together live on stage and uh, with poetry and hip hop and even a bit of Middle Eastern influence. And uh, <laughs> that whole experience was uh, another in a beautiful series of events that really strengthened our friendship and our working relationship and just our musical connection. And Alara then recommended the second musician, Kiernan Ironfield, uh, who plays the Yudaki, the didgeridoo. And this is one of the most <laughs> chill human beings you will ever meet. Uh, just can put your mind at ease whenever you meet him. And... Yet, he is such a beast on the instrument. Uh, again, I invited him to the studio. We had a chat about who he is, where he comes from, and his musical practice. Growing up in Canberra, like, I always knew that I was an Aboriginal person, and I always knew that I was a Darug person. I didn't have a lot of connection to other Aboriginal people there. And then as I got older, I had more of an opportunity to kind of, like, direct myself into different community groups and establish connections and meet people and learn, figure out, you know, what does it mean to be a Darug person and what like obligations I felt with that. And that kind of like directed where I, where I went in life. You know, most of my kind of learning with the instrument has, has honestly just been me sitting with it by myself, just trying to like, trying to figure it out. It's picking up these like tiny little, pieces of knowledge over the years because you know like I didn't grow up with like uncles that were playing it and could teach me and share it with me so I had to kind of like try and seek it out myself but yeah it's something that's like quite dear to my heart and um, I feel very like privileged to be in a position where I can play it and I'd like to get more and more Aboriginal men across the continent playing. I don't know if I've ever seen it in a video game I think, it's, I think it's an incredible instrument for creating vibes, the different keys and the different rhythms and the different like uh, energies that can come through it could probably add a huge amount to, to gaming and the experience. So, you know, maybe this could be the start of, of that happening and we can try and, try and set it up and do it in the right way so that Absolutely. the right people get involved. He just did this incredible set of recordings creating all these different rhythms and sustains and a few sound effects even. And it was incredible to have access to these recordings and really get deep into the instrument as I listen to them over and over again. It becomes a process of learning your musicians, learning who they are, learning what they like to play and uh, what they enjoy doing. And that really informs the process of writing parts back to them. Now, around the time uh, I was first approached to do the score, I just heard violinist and singer Eric Avery for the first time. I completely fell in love with his musicality and his playing and his singing and immediately I was possessed by the desire to have him featured on this score and uh 
at the time he was traveling around and he was uh, uh, he was busy with a whole bunch of projects. So nothing came of it. But something held on to me and I started to write violin parts imagining Eric would be playing them. And the violin kind of became a central instrument to the whole soundtrack as I was working on it. Uh, which maybe wasn't the wisest thing I could have done if I didn't know that he was going to be involved. Uh, but something about the way he played really resonated with me. Now, fast forward uh, quite a bit of time and a couple of conversations, emails, and a phone call later, Eric Avery comes on board. This is very recent, so we haven't had a chance to record yet, uh, especially interstate uh, with a pandemic. But uh, hopefully by the next conference, I'll have some live Eric Avery footage and recording to be able to share. But it's still uh, an incredible thing to have happened and just one of the beautiful miracles of working on this soundtrack and this process. So what does this all sound like in practice? I'll share with you three examples of Kiernan on the Yidaki and three different ways I approached his recordings from the first session. I'll then share with you uh, an example with Alara uh, where I was inspired by the recordings of her first session to write her a part she could embody and how she then recorded onto that track and then cr ran wild with it with her imagination. So to begin with, uh, Kiernan and the Yidaki. So here I have the recordings from the first session uh, pulled into my music software, which is Cubase is what I use. A wealth of sonic information uh, in this one session. And in this piece, I wanted to use one of the rhythms that he had thought of and build a track around it. And uh, this was his recording. So I was really liking that rhythm and I figured, okay, what if we pulled it in uh, and then cut it up to maintain the rhythm, but just fit it into a tempo uh, of a track that I could just keep steady. So this is what it sounds like when I cut it up. So it's faster because I've uh, I wanted to write a track that was a bit faster, but it still maintains his own rhythmic ideas and elements. So this is what it sounds like um, in the context of the track. I uh, worked off of that rhythm. I started doing some percussive parts um, and I played some guitars, and uh, here's the result.
So that felt pretty cool to me to be able to build off of what Kiernan did and just build something on it in the way you would in a live jam session. Now for something a little more extreme, uh, where I took some of uh, Kiernan's performances and uh, I made some liberal use of some, some effects to uh, create something a little more atmospheric, a little more ethereal, uh, that begins with the Yadaki, but expands to something else. So here uh, we have some of the uh, recordings from Kiernan, um, and I've put them together in a certain way. What I have done is I've applied a bit of a time stretch. They're 400% their original length which uh, creates a bit of uh, <laughs> a few artifacts, a few sonic artifacts. So right now, it, it's this manipulation doesn't sound uh, that pleasant. However, when you apply a few effects to it, uh, some reverbs, uh, some echoes and uh, a few more things, it begins to sound like this. I'll cut a little further into the track so you can hear some of the different layers uh, I was playing with in this more ethereal context. Finally, here's one of the main tracks that plays in Enchanted during the main gameplay, and one that combines the work of Kiernan and Alara at different stages of the process, from the first sessions and from final recording sessions that take place after the soundtrack's been developed, inspired by the initial improvisations. So, starting again with Kiernan and the Yudaki, I took one of his rhythms and... The manipulations here are halfway between preserving what he did and the extreme of making it sound almost unrecognizable. So I stretched and compressed his uh, performances uh, to fit into the tempo of the track. And this is what it sounds like without any effects applied. <laughs> As you might be able to hear, this is two of his performances layered on top of each other and playing together. So I did a bit of uh, my own creative process and I moved them to opposite sides so you can hear one in each ear. And then I applied a little extra uh, movement of my own. And this is what that sounds like. <laughs> which on its own might not sound nearly as impressive as Kiernan's original performance, and I completely acknowledge that. However, in the context of the rest of the track and the other instruments, I felt that this version of the rhythm uh, fits a little better. 
which is not a comment at all on Kiernan's own performance because he was creating his parts without this track. And I'm here uh, creating this track and then pulling his work into it. So this is what the Yidaki sounds like in the context of the track and all the instruments, uh, the percussion that I'd laid down and some of the guitar parts that I played, um, and then how Kiernan fits into it. Let it run through with a little more violin as well. So you can see what what I imagine writing for Eric Avery. So as a final hurrah, uh, this is what happens when I write a bass part inspired by Alara's improvisations in the first session and develop them in this track and then get her to record those parts and whatever else she brings. So this is the bass part that I wrote uh, in this track, just isolate it. Uh, this is just using a virtual instrument. This is something I could just play on the keyboard uh, and try to emulate the sound of the bass, but it's never, it can come close to the real thing, but it's never gonna be the real thing. So this is the part that I wrote. So just kind of doubling what uh, what you're hearing on the guitar, I uh, brought this to Alara, and then we had a uh, pandemic inflicted recording session <laughs> uh, just over Zoom. She recorded on her end and then sent me the files, and uh, I could then cut them up and incorporate them here um, in any way. This light is nice. What do you reckon? She'll do it? I think so. All right. The way she would uh, interpret some of these lines, uh, based on her own comfort, based on her own uh, musicality and just how she sees the music or how she hears it, uh, it's just incredible to hear. So this is what her part sounds like, isolated.
and uh, just the <laughs> and just hearing the ways she reinterpreted those lines uh, and just did her own thing with them was just incredible. And this is what it sounds like in the context uh, of the rest of the piece. So hearing Alara take the part that I wrote for her with her in mind, hoping that she would identify with it, it's just an incredible process to realize and be part of. Uh, and if you're a composer who hasn't worked with live musicians, I highly recommend it, not just because of what live session musicians can do with the parts you write, but what they can then create of their own accord. And uh, I asked Alara, hey, what if you pulled out the bow and, you know, did something with it on the bass and see what your ideas were? And she did. And so <laughs> this extra part was born from it. <laughs> Just her taking that and reinterpreting it. I'll just play this and the last section uh, with Alara's live bass on top. So here it is. And that's all I got for you today. Uh, a peek into this process of writing the music for Enchanted and uh, this process of celebrating culture via collaboration, via conversation, and this lifetime's worth of tradition, culture, music, and knowledge spoken through the voices of these amazing musicians and giving life to the sound of this game. I guess let's just keep keep trying to do the right thing and yeah, keep our energies high and take care of each other and ourselves. Amina Shamali, thank you for joining me and I hope you have a fantastic rest of the conference. Just about time for uh, Reba Eats. Yes. <laughs>